I'd like to uh, talk to you about how to know this Lord God Almighty that uh, has been sung about, prayed to, and worshipped this evening. Our theme this evening is Look and Live. And uh, in your little uh, bulletins that you got, you see that each time we meet each month, we're going to have a different theme. Tonight's theme is taken right here from John chapter 3. And we're going to be reading through and looking at starting in verse 13. But the backdrop for all this for you is asking you a question. And the question is, have you ever looked at Jesus? And if you have, in other words, that's another way of saying, are you saved or born again or, or uh, a Christian or someone who has eternal life, if that has happened, if you have looked at Jesus, are you really living tonight? Because salvation is supposed to change you absolutely, completely from the inside out, and you're a totally different person. Now, who is this addressed to? The best way to understand the Bible is to understand uh, just who God was talking to and what that portion of Scripture meant to them. So look at John 3 in your Bibles, and on the next slide, if you don't have one or if you're not sitting close enough to see one, I'll put the verses up, but for those of you that have your Bibles, this is an incredible dialogue Jesus had, starting in verse 13. What is looking at Jesus? Jesus is going to describe this and tell this to someone. And the someone we find out in the, in the first 12 verses before this is named Nicodemus. Now, this guy uh, would be in the newspapers today because he was the number three wealthiest man of the whole ancient Bible world. So, I mean, this guy is a, a big guy. His name was Nicodemus. Now, he had an older brother who was even wealthier, whose books are still around. Uh, his name was Josephus. If you've ever heard of Josephus, Nicodemus and Josephus were actually related, those of you Bible scholar buffs. Uh, but Nicodemus was a religious guy. Josephus was non-religious. Nicodemus thought he was uh, set and going to heaven because he was so religious. And so he gets to meet Jesus personally. He was a little embarrassed, so he came at night. You know, most people are a little embarrassed about spiritual things. You know, they don't like to talk about You know, Remember, in America, we don't discuss what politics and religion, okay? And so he didn't want to talk about it. So Jesus accepted him coming at night. And this is what happens in verse 13. Jesus says this, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Jesus tells him, point number one, to know God. And here's what it is. The Son came down. Now, I want you to understand in your minds who Jesus is. Jesus is God come down to earth. I'll never forget about a mile from here, right over at, uh, what's that, Garnett and the other uh, 61st. There's a little shop opening, one of those that put out the coupon and said, all alterations are really, really cheap because we're opening our shop. So I took over all my suits that needed to be altered. They all have to be taken in as I get skinnier and skinnier. And so I took them over to get them taken in. And as I was standing there, uh, Bonnie was praying because we could tell that we had a divine appointment. This young lady, as she was working on, on putting pins through us, I didn't want to witness to her so much that she would, you know, pin me. But, but she was looking and I said, you know what? God came down. I'll never forget how big her eyes got. She was from Vietnam. She said, God? God? You know, she had a real accent. God? I said, yes. Came down. She couldn't believe that. And I said, and he became a man. That's when her eyes really got big. Because, you know, I guess Buddha or whatever was not, you know, it wasn't quite like that. I mean, she could not believe that. And her eyes got, that's probably what Nicodemus, the son came down. Jesus said, that's who I am. I'm God. I came down. But look at the next verse, the 14th verse. And this is how Jesus, and this is what I want you to get tonight before you go, and that's how did Jesus describe this salvation, this looking and living. Verse 14, here, here's the, the great message. And as Moses, I mean, of all, Jesus, anything he said was scripture. He could have told a new story. But if he was going to describe salvation, this is the story he told. I, I never grow tired of examining how Jesus himself, God come down, the Son come down, how he describes salvation. Listen to this, verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he tells a second point, a second truth. And that is, the Son of Man came down to be lifted up. So, so Nicodemus is trying to correlate this rich guy who was very religious, who wanted to know God personally, realized there was a vacuum, a void, an emptiness. Uh, he couldn't quite make it to God. And he came to Jesus, asked him how he could know God personally. And Jesus tells him this little story. And he says, the Son of Man came down to be lifted up. Now look at verse 16. This is the best known verse, by the way, in the Bible. In fact, most people that don't know anything about the Lord know this verse. This is the first one you learn when you're a little kid, when you're in Sunday school or vacation Bible school. In fact, I have a little 
clay, um, plaster of Paris, I guess it is, bunny rabbit. I don't know why they gave me a bunny rabbit. Because I said this first when I was two and a half years old. I still have it. It hasn't even broken yet. I, I think maybe my wife's glued it back together. But I still have that. In the bottom it says, Johnny said John 3.16 when he was two and a half. So I mean, anybody can learn it. Because I learned it when I was two and a half. But look what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, look at this, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus reveals the final truth. And here it is. For us to get out of perishing and into everlasting life, we have to get to know the son who came down and who was lifted up. And you say, well, that sounds pretty interesting. Why did Jesus tell this story? Well, I think he told it because he wanted to describe what looking at Jesus is. Three points. Think of them again. Here it is. The son came down, that's 3 in verse 13, to be lifted up, and we know how he was lifted up. He was lifted up between heaven and earth on a tree. Actually, Peter, who witnessed it, says he was hung on a tree. He said that near the end of his life. He also said it in the book of Acts. So he, he was convinced of it his entire life until his death, that Jesus was hung on a tree. He was lifted up and hung on a tree, probably uh, whatever was a common tree back then, an olive tree. He carried the crossbar. He was nailed to the crossbar, then stuck up there and nailed to the rest. It's just horrific how it was done. But look at this. For us to get out of perishing and into everlasting life. Now, that's what Jesus told a religious man who thought he was going to heaven. Now, all of us are religious. We're here tonight, right? I mean, you could get a lot of music tonight all over Tulsa. You wanted religious music, so we're religious, right? But the question tonight is, have you ever seen Jesus? And if so, are you living that life? Now, what did Jesus tell him? How does this happen? Okay, Jesus tells this man a story containing the best news ever told. And this is what the story is. Jesus explains to him how to really live. This guy had money. He had a position. He was revered. He was one of the great teachers of his day, Nicodemus. But Jesus said, I, I want you to know how to really live. I, wanted, I want you to know how to be forgiven completely. This man was involved in religious ceremony. He worked at the temple. At the temple, there was a constant stream of animals. This is Jewish sacrificial ritual worship. They would bring up these animals, they would, they would kill them and collect their bloods, they would skin them, and then they would take the pieces after they were cut up and piled up on a, a wood-burning flame on top of an altar and consume them completely. This man was doing this all day long and around it, but he didn't know how to have his sins forgiven completely. And finally, Jesus tells him how to be sure he was going to heaven and not hell. The end of this verse says, if you have me, Jesus said, you have life. And if you don't, you're going to face everlasting judgment. Now, before we go to the story, which is in Numbers 21, I want to tell you this. Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. N nowadays, most people don't talk about hell at all. I spoke at a huge uh, Christian university in Ohio. And when I got done speaking, the president of that school came to me and said, you are the first person in the whole time I've been exposed to school, 25 years, to ever preach about hell as a sermon. He said, thank you. We're keeping that and playing it on the radio. He said, that is a keeper. You know what? It's not popular. Jesus talked more about hell, two for one, than he did about heaven. But he only talked about it for people to escape it. Now, let me, let me go to uh, the book of Numbers. And if you know where that is in the Old Testament, chapter 21 of the book of Numbers. And what I want to show you is this story from Numbers 21. Let me read it to you. It's in verse 4. Um, Jesus, when he got to explain salvation to this man, how did he explain it? He explains it by telling a story. It's not the story I would have picked, but boy, I now love this story because Jesus loved it. And it contains all that you need to know about the Christian life, getting to be a Christian, or living the Christian life. Now, some of you, you're sitting here and you say, I'm in the worship team, I don't need this, you know, I'm just going to think about my music afterward. No, no, no. Jesus told this as a two-sided story. This is not only how you get eternal life, this is how you live this kind of life. Let me show you, starting in verse 4. I'll read it all, and then I'll explain it point by point. The children of Israel, verse 4, journey from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea. This is over... Uh, <laughs> This is down where all the news is. You know, This is right over by Saudi Arabia between there and Egypt and, and Israel, the, the wilderness. Uh, 
it's on all the maps about you know the dangers and problems over there today. So we're very contemporary. To go around the land of Edom and the soul of the people were very discouraged. So they were having a hard day. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, which is normal. People get upset and they, they get angry at the Lord and don't like what he's doing. Why did you make me and why did he let this happen? Why do good things or bad things happen to good people and all that? And against Moses, people usually complain against their leader and their supervisors or whatever. Now look at this. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. There's no food or water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord responded, verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents. That's interesting. We were just singing a song up here about seraphim. Same word. Now, these aren't angel serpents. They're fiery. Seraphim are fiery. They're burning. These angels that are on God's throne, they're just burning. These serpents were burning, only the burning was the venom. And it caused the person to feel like they were on fire. By the way, these snakes are still there today. Descendants, of course, 3,500 years down the line. They're still huge, fiery serpents. You ought to read what the, the uh, uh, people that examine the terrain there tell. They say that they're a minimum of two inches wide. And these are monster, dreadfully feared serpents. So the Lord sent these fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. And the people said, we've sinned against and spoken against the Lord. And against you, Moses, pray the Lord that he takes these serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. Set it up on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. And Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. So it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. What a weird story. I mean, that is, that is a strange story. I mean, that God would send serpents, that the serpents were deadly, that all the people got bitten and they were dying, and the remedy was to look at something that bit you. I mean, I mean, that is only the Lord could think of. I mean, who would want to? I mean, uh, I see my wonderful wife over there. She sees a, a spider or a mouse. She attacks it. She doesn't put it up on a pole and look at it. I mean, it's just, it was, can you imagine if it was killing you? Okay, let's go through the story. Number one, everyone bitten by the snakes would die. Okay, there's the first truth we can get. Second one is, there was only one antidote for the deadly poison. It's listed in our scripture. Thirdly, they had to seek out to get that cure. Uh, they, they had to do something. If you notice, the text says you have to look at, at the serpent. So let's, let's understand this. The first truth, these fiery, poisonous snakes were unavoidable. Now, I've been thinking about this uh, ever since uh, we started praying about this. It was more than three or four weeks ago that they've been practicing, Jason. It's been a long time. And so I've been thinking about what to speak about. And I started praying about this. Do you know what it would be like to be living in a tent in the middle of West Oklahoma, with no big hunting boots, no car to get into to shut the doors that no snake could get in, to be sleeping down near the ground in a tent, and to have these two-inch wide, six-feet long, fiery serpents able to get into your tent. You're wearing sandals with open toes, so when you walk around at night, I mean, you know, if any reason you have to go walking out somewhere, you know, to the outhouse or something, you would be so scared that there would be a snake out there. Can you imagine, and that's why I wrote down, there was no way to avoid these snakes. I mean, they, have you ever seen a snake? I mean, they can swim across our pool like that. You ever seen a snake on water? Right across the top. I mean, I used to think that if they were in the water, I could get out. They could get across the pool. They don't, they don't go like this. They just go like that, right across the surface of the water. They climb trees. We were eating dinner with someone from the church on their picnic table, and we were sitting under this massive oak tree, and they said, yeah, the last time someone was over here, there was this big six-foot-long black snake, and it was so heavy it broke the branch and it fell on the table. My wife was back in the house just like that. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? Snakes can climb trees. They climb rocks. We were over at Bass Pro Shop in Springfield, and there was one climbing right up a rock. And I thought, you know, you'd get away from a snake in a tree or get up on the... They just can go anywhere. So these things were unavoidable. Second truth about them, people were laying helplessly in the grip of death after they got bit. The, have you ever seen someone bitten by a poisonous snake? It's gross. These kind especially, immediately the people get a horrific fever. And they start burning up with fever. Then they start vomiting. And then they start getting into unconsciousness. And so all over the camp, and I don't want to be gross. We do have refreshments afterward. But think about it. It's the way Jesus shared salvation. He said all these people are laying helplessly on the ground, unable to get away from these serpents. And they're in the grips of death. Lastly, the only hope was to look up 
at this lifted up brass serpent. Okay, that's the story Jesus told. Let's think about it by applying it to Nicodemus, okay? Number one, applying this to Nicodemus. Jesus was telling him everyone bitten by the snake would die, okay? And there was only one antidote for the deadly poison, and they had to seek out the cure. What would that mean in this story to Nicodemus? Well, number one, it meant this, all humans. Jesus was looking at Nicodemus. He said, you don't live in the desert 1,500 years ago, but you are also infected. We're infected with another virus, the SIN virus, okay? And everyone who gets infected with that virus dies. You want to check it out? Just count the time down from birth. Let enough years go by. There's not a single person in this room that will not die. Do you know why? God says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The proof we're all sinners is none of us are immortal in this body. Because we're tainted by sin. So he said, number one, all humans have been infected with a sin virus. Number two, people live life helplessly in the grip of death. Did you know I'm in, I'm in the business of helping people that, that are dying or that have died. And their family comes to me and they, they just sit around. And those people are just so overwhelmed because that loved one died. And you know what? I look at them and I think, you're so overwhelmed, you're going to die too. And so am I. See, we're all helplessly in the grip of death. Now, some of you are very young. You don't feel it very much. But time goes by. Death is inevitable. Finally, the only hope was to look at the lifted up Jesus. He said, he said Nicodemus, I want you to understand why I told you the snake story. You're also bitten, and, and you also are helplessly in the grip of death, and you also have only one choice. Okay, that brings us to the next. What was the message that Jesus gave to him? Well, he said the snake's fiery venom was horribly deadly, and he said the brass snake on the pole was the only cure. See, he's trying... He's working through with Nicodemus this truth, and he wants him to understand it. He also said the cure worked no matter how badly they were bitten. You know, it didn't matter if someone got, you know, that snake just stuck on them, you know, and bit them 25 times, or if someone just got it on the toe. Both of them had the venom. Both of them were going to die. So Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus something. Number one, there was nothing left for them but death. You see, if you got bit... There's nothing left for you but death. It's coming. Nicodemus, <laughs> Jesus was saying, you ever been bit by sin? Are you a sinner, Nicodemus? Secondly, there was nothing else they could do that would help. Jesus uh, was pointing out to Nicodemus that the only hope these people had was looking at this lifted up serpent that was made of brass and wrapped around a pole or an ensign, actually the Greek word or the Hebrew word is ensign, which was a cross piece that would hold like a banner. So it's probably very similar to a cross, very fitting in the Old Testament. Last thing is, there was no one too sick for, for God's cure to heal. Didn't matter how many times they were bitten. So, so Nicodemus is starting to get this message. So this is what Jesus reminded Nicodemus. He said, the cure only worked for individuals. Uh, the only source of hope was, was this serpent up on the snake, up on the, the uh, ensign or on the pole. That was the only hope. And it worked for anyone of any age, anywhere. And the cure worked, no matter how often they had to use it. It wasn't like it was running down. It wasn't like, I remember when, do you remember when uh, anthrax was going around in the postal system and they said, we only have uh, 50 million vaccinations. Oh, that was comforting. You know, because there's 300 million of us. And I mean, I, I didn't open the mail for quite a while. And every time I licked a letter, I felt like I got a little on my tongue, you know, because it was all out there somewhere. But, but you know what? There was only this. The cure worked no matter how often they had to use it. Now, what, what is the evidence that Jesus was telling Nicodemus? There was no one else that could look for them. I want you to think about this. If your dad had gotten bit and he was laying down there, vomiting and dying, you couldn't run to the center of the camp and look up at the pole and your dad would get well. See, there's something about this. He said, they have to look themselves. No one else could look for them. Secondly, there was no place too far from the cure. Most of us that read the Bible don't even think about it, but do you know how far it is from here to ORU? Uh, if you went from here to ORU and went from here to Elm Street and Broken Arrow, those would be the outside borders of the camp of Israel. We're talking about 600,000 tents and oxen and carts and everything else. It was over nine miles wide, and it was over nine miles long. And you know what? 
one snake on one pole held up in the middle of the camp would be very hard to see if you were way out there at ORU or way over there at Elm. You know what was amazing? These people were deathly ill, laying on the ground, just horribly sick, dying with fever-wracked bodies, and all they had to do is just kind of help them up and say, hey, you know what? Moses said, if you will look over that way, in the center of the camp, there's a, can't see it? Probably the person was so feverish they couldn't even see. You know what it was? He was telling them, there was no place too far from the cure to be helped. And there was nothing more that was needed than God to heal them. All they had to do was look. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus that night. Now, real quickly, let's just go through the whole thing. What's the message Jesus gave him? Uh, we already have studied this. The, the snake's fiery venom was deadly. The snake on the pole was the only cure. The cure worked no matter how badly they were bitten, how many times. The cure worked only for individuals. Uh, there was one source of hope for anyone of any age, anywhere, and the cure worked no matter how many times you tried it. That's Jesus' little message to him. What did that mean to Nicodemus? That there was nothing left for Nicodemus but death. He had to understand he was hopeless himself. This is how Jesus presented the gospel. Fascinating to me. Secondly, there was nothing else he could do that would help. He, he couldn't take one more animal. He couldn't give any more money. There's nothing else he could do. Thirdly, he was not too sick for God's cure to heal him. You know, that's one thing I, I meet is people that say, no, I, God couldn't save me. I've done too many, uh, too many things. Or I've tried too many times. It doesn't work for me. Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, you can't be too sick for God. There was no one else that could look for him. He just said, Mrs. Nicodemus can't help you, your parents, you know, your children, just you. He was not too far from the cure to be helped. You know, that's something I think about. We're standing here in 2002. That means the cross is 2,002 years or 1,972 years away. But it doesn't matter how far away you are from the cure. It works at any distance. It's a wonderful truth. Last thing he was letting him know, there was nothing more needed than to ask for God's cure, and he'd be healed. Let's just wrap this up so we can pray. Here's a summary of Christ's offer, and this is what I want you to take home with you from this snake story, okay? I want you to remember this. Number one, for the desperate with nothing left, for those who have nothing else, for those who, no matter how sick they are, for what no one else can do for you, for any place, no matter how far you are away from or feeling your way from the Lord, as long as you live near poison, listen to this, looking at Jesus instantly, immediately, and completely will cure you forever. That's what salvation is. Some of you have been going to church all your life, never realized that. Some of you never heard this before, and some of you know it, and you need to share it. Jesus cures instantly, immediately, and forever. Well, one more truth, and I just want you to think about this. Questions to ask ourselves tonight. Number one, are you infected with SIN? Not HIV, SIN. HIV, at least they can hold it off for a while. You cannot hold off the SIN virus. It will kill you. No one has ever survived it. No one. I know people that survive HIV. I have a dear friend, a doctor of pharmacology. He's a genius. He's helping people survive. No one survives SIN. And it has eternal consequences. Secondly, do you want the cure? Do you want the cure if you have SIN? Number three, have you looked to Jesus? He's the only one that has it. And it's not enough to just look. You have to listen. Do you want him to cure you? You see, those people, it's interesting. There's a change in the word in, in the, the book of Numbers. It, Moses said, whoever looks, he quoted the Lord. And it says there in Numbers 21 and verse 9, everyone who beheld, that means they looked and they kept their gaze fixed in that, on that picture, that snake lifted up. They were cured. So you have to want him to cure you. Last truth, and I'm going to pray, as the serpent was lifted up. Now listen to this. This is a summary. Remember, I, was, I used to teach. I taught in college and in university and seminary, taught high schoolers, and I learned that you repeat yourself about four times, and the people with wandering minds hear you at least once, okay? So this is my fourth time, and now you'll hear it at least once. Number one, from anywhere in the camp, we're talking about 81 square miles of tents, a nine-mile by nine-mile square of 600,000 tents. That's how big the camp of Israel was. Number one, from anywhere in that camp. Number two, by anyone that would look, anywhere they were, 
In any place, no matter how far they were away from that pole, to any person, no matter how many times they had been bitten or how, how sick they were, for any number of poisonous bites, that, that old uh, serpent could have just been going, bah, 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 bah. didn't matter how many times. For any moment, you still breathe. See, this thing was good, right? I mean, you could run up and down the, the aisles of the campground and say, won't you look, won't you look, won't you look? And you know what? We know because Nicodemus' brother wrote a history about this, Josephus. He said that a vast number of the people refused to look. They said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Look at a snake? Never. That thing bit me? I won't look at it. But listen, look at the cross and you will live, is what Jesus told Nicodemus. You know, tonight, Jesus Christ it's just like that serpent lifted up. I want you to think. They, Moses did not take a real serpent and put it up on a stick. He made in the likeness of a serpent out of brass. Jesus is not a sinner. He came in the likeness of sinners to be lifted up on a pole to take our sins. So if we'll look at him, we'll live. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for uh, the hearts that planned this wonderful evening. I thank you for the giftedness and talents you've given to all of these young people who sang, who played, who ministered. But I thank you that the whole purpose we came here is because you tell us if we look, we'll live. And for some here tonight, they've never looked at you. So they are not going to live forever with you. They are infected with the SIN virus, and not one person escapes it. And you said that the soul that sinneth, it shall die, and not just physically, but spiritually, and eternally, and not unconsciously, but consciously separated from you in the most horrible place, the garbage dump of the universe that never goes out the fires. But the good news is you don't want anyone to go there. You made that only for Satan and his angels. And so anyone tonight who will look and live, and will gaze at the Son of Man who came down to be lifted up to keep us from perishing. Lord, I pray for those. And then I pray for the Christians who are here, that they would realize that as they have received the Lord, so they walk in you, and that looking back to you at all times when we are bitten again by the terrible bites of sin, of our flesh, of the world, of the devil, and when we yield to temptation and sin and feel so far away from you and so distant and so defiled, all we have to do is look back and remember that you already have paid the price for our sins and that there's life to look at you. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help any who have never looked at you to look tonight and for those that have looked at you to look back again and to know that they're cleansed and to know that they're forgiven and to know that they can live and walk in newness of life through you, Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. 